Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. I'm Charlotte Maillard Schultz, Chief of Protocol of the City and Counties of San Francisco and the State of California, member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors and your chair for the program. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at thecommonwealthclub.com. We are honored that today's program will feature a rare appearance by retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and will be in conversation with Dr. Mary Bitterment. You are an aware audience, so I know that you know that President Ronald Reagan nominated Sandra Day O'Connor as the first woman associate justice of the Supreme Court in 1981 and she was confirmed by a 99 to zero vote. You may not know that the 100th senator called to apologize for not being there. <laughs> How nice. <laughs> and I know you know that she received her BA and her law degree from our very own Stanford University. From there, she can humorously tell about looking for jobs as a young woman attorney and then serving lots of coffee to the gentlemen around the office in those early jobs. Of course, you know she went on to an illustrious legal career in private practice and served in all three branches of government, including her time as the Assistant Attorney General of Arizona, Majority Leader of the Arizona State Senate, and a judge on the Arizona Court of Appeals. After retiring from the court in 2006, Justice O'Connor founded iCivics, which I believe you will hear more about from Justice O'Connor today. Young Americans, and I know we have some in the audience, are describing the program as only they can, in their word, awesome. <laughs> of course, she went on to, to uh, after receiving the, uh, I think I've already told you that. Uh, okay, here are some things that you may not know. Unless you have read her inspiring book, the Lazy Bee, written with her brother, Alan, after they're growing up on their family ranch on their harsh yet beautiful land of the Lazy Bee Ranch in Arizona. You may not know that it helped make her the woman she is today, the lessons she's learned about the world, self-reliance, and survival, and how the land, people, and values of the Lazy Bee shaped her. You may not know that Justice O'Connor has an incredible sense of humor. Her wit will knock your socks off. <laughs> to be entertained by the justice is like no other, even, though, even when she is giving a dinner in the Supreme Court in one of the elegant, paneled, high ceiling rooms with chandeliers, tapestries, and huge portraits of a star austere looking men, mostly with mustaches. You feel like you are in her living room. She is serving you drinks and dinner, and then some homegrown entertainment. Of course, it was Condoleezza Rice playing the piano. Lastly, I asked my husband, former Secretary of State George Schultz, how he would introduce Justice O'Connor. He started going on and on, and I said, wait, it has to be short, one sentence, a few words. He said, and I quote, Two words for Sandra Day O'Connor, integrity and wisdom. And now it is my uh, pleasure, pleasure to introduce our panel today, led by wonderful Mary Bitterman, who has a wonderful background as well in many kinds of community service, and now the chair of the Bernie Bernard Osher Foundation. Thank you. Okay. Justice O'Connor, we warmly welcome you to the Commonwealth Club. Well, thank you. Which has um, a long history, but falls four years short of the 113 years that your family was on the Lazy Bee Ranch. Had the Lazy Bee, Ranch. Bee. yeah. And uh, like my good friend Charlotte Schultz, I recommend to everyone your wonderful book written with your brother Alan called The Lazy Bee, Growing Up on a Cattle Ranch in the American Southwest. Yeah. 
There is so much wisdom in this book, such colorful description of such an important time and part of our country. And as Charlotte suggested, and as you have in this book, this is what gave you what my grandmother used to call the starch, I think. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> to be able to do all of the extraordinary, extraordinary things that you've done. There's nothing like ranch life to toughen you up a little bit. I mean, if it's a remote ranch like ours, we were 35 miles from the nearest small town. And so if something went wrong, there was no yellow pages and no phone to call if you'd had a yellow pages. So you had to do it yourself. And you had to get on a train and go stay with your grandmother to go to, to go school. To go to school, I did, uh -huh. in El Paso. I went that way. I, I know that um, uh, Justice O'Connor actually took a course with Wallace Stegner, and it's wonderful the way you sort of seamlessly quote some things of his in your own book at the introduction to various chapters. And one that really uh, piqued my, my interest was, um, especially now with 80% of Americans living a very urban life. I know. You quoted like San him Francisco. as saying... Um, I mean, it's a nice city, but it's but a But it's city. a little crowded. It's a little yeah. crowded. I love this part about, it was probably a step in the making of a cow hand when he learned that what would pass for heroics for a softer world was only chores around here. That's for sure. Would you like to share with our audience just a few, especially some of the young people up there in the balcony, we have over 100 students from San Francisco's high schools, um, what some of those chores might have been and how unusual some of your, well, say, Stanford I... University friends might have found the description? <laughs> well, it was all unusual out there because we had no <laughs> amenities whatsoever. Uh, it was a pretty tough world, and we only went to town once a week, and when we got to town, it was very small. There was a, a grocery, and we would have to go buy groceries, and there wasn't much choice when you got there. And the basic diet of people living out like we did was frijole beans. You might not even know what they are, but they're a black, dried bean that you have to cook forever to make them soft enough to eat. And beef, we, were, we raised cattle, so we uh, butcher our own beef and hang them in a little room that we tried to keep reasonably cool so you could hang it up there because we didn't have refrigeration. So, I mean, that was kind of the diet. But then diet. you plumped up some dried apricots and put on the biscuits, which sounded quite well, nice. Right, because you could get dried fruit, like apricots or apples or something like that, and you could soften that up and cook it and have something. And you made biscuits every day, probably. Um, but it was um, kind of an interesting life. And the chores, you wanted to know about the chores. We kept a couple of milk cows so we could have um, milk to drink. And you had to take care of them. Somebody had to be sure you fed them and that they were milked at the same time. I mean, you can't put something off for a milk cow. When it's time to be milked, they want to be milked. So there you are. And then um, you had to feed the chickens. We kept chickens as well and had to collect the eggs and take care of the chickens. And you had to feed the milk cow or cows, if you had a couple of them there, and get them milked at the right time of day, every day. And I, there was just a lot to do. And if there were some horses, you kept a few horses around at all times so you could get on them and go wrangle other horses if you needed them and you had to have them fed and cared for. So, you know, there was a lot to do just to keep things running. And your father's expectations were very high. I remember once very. when you were going to take lunch out to the Roundup that you had a flat tire. I did. <laughs> I, you know, when they had Roundups, it took 30 days going to a different place on the ranch every single day to round up the cattle in that segment of the ranch and then the next day move to the next spot. And every day at noon, then somebody was designated to be the roundup cook and would take a lunch out to the cowboys, and they were starved by that time. They'd gotten up before daylight, and they'd been on horses till God knows when. So by 10 o'clock in the morning, it was past lunchtime. You had to have the food out and the lunch hot and build a fire and make a pot of coffee in the fire and all that stuff and have everything ready for that day's roundup. And it was just a big 
big effort to keep things going, that's all. And so the one day that you were going out there and had and a flat I, tire. The day I was, well, not the day, no, I went many times, day. but one day when I was assigned to take the hot lunch out to the cowboys at some designated spot, it was a place that was very far out, and I was going along and I had a flat tire. Well, it was on an old pickup truck, and I don't think that tire had ever been flat before. I had the hardest time in the world getting it loose and pulled off the, the, the prongs on the, the wheel to get the tire off so I could put on another tire. It was just a nightmare. I didn't think I was going to get it done. I had to put the um, thing on to loosen the bolts, and I had to jump on it to try to loosen it because I didn't have the strength to get off oh, to forever. And by the time I got the tire changed and got the lunch out to the Cowboys, it was way past time. And my father was just livid with me for not having it there. And I explained to him when I drove up, he didn't even want to say hello. And I said, I'm sorry, I had a flat tire. He said, well, you should have started earlier. I mean, that was the deal. <laughs> it was nothing like what an uh -uh. extraordinary no, daughter no. I had. No, no, uh -uh. <laughs> nothing like that. Expectations were high. That's right. And you, you, you talk in the book about, you know, as you look back on the quality of, of that life, which so very, very few people uh, would have today. Association with our old-time, long-suffering, good-natured cowboys, mm -hmm. living in isolation with just one another and mm -hmm. few luxuries, mm -hmm. as you said, eating mostly beef mm -hmm. and beans, mm -hmm. riding horseback for long hours in the heat and dust, mm -hmm. seeing the plant, animal, insect, and bird life at the southwest close at hand, and enjoying the love and companionship of your parents, not just on evenings and weekends, but all the time. Mm -hmm. And then you said, it was not until I grew up and moved away that I learned how unusual my early life was. Yes, I know. Because if that's how you grow up, you think, well, that must be the way it is for most people. And it wasn't. But it was an, an interesting way of life, and you had to be pretty self-sufficient to manage. Yeah, yeah. It's we didn't have any electricity. There was no telephone. And, of course, no television. <laughs> <laughs> And wait till we move forward, and then we'll see that the justice is not only involved with television, but on the internet and everything else. The, the road from the Lazy Bee to the Supreme Court of the United States was a very interesting one for you. Um, we'll sort of fast forward because there's so many fantastic things. But you graduated third in your class at Stanford Law School. I guess so. They didn't really keep records. They can't verify anything. But well, I, but I, I we did know. well in law school. <laughs> We know. I did well. Let's say at the top of the class, since we have some license here. And I had a classmate named William Ray. I know you did. <laughs> and he was terrific. <laughs> and it's he so nice that you were able to sit on the yes. bench together. Yeah, it was. But the interesting thing is, after you finished that prestigious law school and uh, were so highly um, ranked in your class, that in trying to get a legal position, it was very difficult, and you ended up in well, a secretary's yeah, position. Would, Share that. Well, I didn't end up with that, but I was offered a secretarial uh, position. I didn't take it. Now, I had graduated, and I had met my husband-to-be while in law school, and he was a year behind me. And so I graduated, and he still had a year to go, and we decided to get married out on the Lazy Bee Ranch, by yeah, the way. Which, wonderful pictures. Which was kind of fun. Yeah. But anyway, um, it, was, it was a difficult time because we both liked to eat, and that meant one of us had to work, and he was still in school, so that was me. I was out of law school. And my classmates from Stanford all had good paying jobs in the big firms up here in San Francisco, earning a living as lawyers, very distinguished. There were at least 40 names of law firms and phone numbers on a bulletin board at Stanford from law firms in California saying, Stanford law graduates, call us. We'd like to talk to you about possible employment. I called every telephone number on the bulletin board. Not a single one of them would give me an interview. They wouldn't even talk to me. 
And here they had this thing up, Stanford Law Graduates, call us. And I said, well, now, why won't you start? Well, we don't hire women lawyers. Oh, well, why not? Well, we just never have. And our clients wouldn't stand for it. Now, that was the response that I got from Matt. And I finally wrote, this will interest you, I heard that the county attorney in San Mateo County, California, county seat, Redwood City, had once had a woman lawyer on his staff. And I thought, well, if he'd had one, he could have another. And I wrote him and made an appointment to go see him. And he was very nice. To this day, the voters elect the county attorney in the counties, which is amazing. Imagine that. So he was elected. And elected officials are glad handers. In case you didn't know that, they're always glad to meet you. You might be a vote. So um, he welcomed me. And we sat and talked. And he looked at my resume. And oh, you have a fine resume here. But he said, you know, I, I did have a woman here one time on the staff, and she did a good job. I'd be happy to have another, and you've got a good resume. But I get my money from the County Board of Supervisors, and I'm not funded to hire another deputy. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. But let me show you around the offices. As you're here, you might as well see. So he walked me through, and sure enough, every office was occupied by some lawyer, and we saw that. And he said, thanks so much for coming around. And I explained to him that it was very important to me to get a job. And I said, um, I know you don't have any money, you explained to me. But I'll be willing to work for you for nothing if you will let me work in your office until such time as the supervisors give you a little more money. That's all right with me. And I said, um, he said, well, I don't have space to put you. And I said, I know, you showed me around. I said, I met your secretary. She's very nice. And there's room in her office to put a second desk if she wouldn't object. Now, that was my first job out of law school. No pay. <laughs> and I put my desk in with the secretary. Well, you know what? I loved my job. I really did. It was great. I got to a answer various questions that were posed by the district attorney and his deputies and the different uh, agencies of the county. And I just loved what I was doing. So it was all right, except the pay was a little slender. <laughs> <laughs> but then as we move forward, just give everyone a sense of when you learned the President Reagan, when you met with the president, I know you talked about horses, about a number of things, and that the stir that it caused on the Lazy Bee as the information went out across the state of Arizona and the nation yes, well, about your appointment. It was a shock that President Reagan ended up hiring a cowgirl from Arizona to go on the US Supreme Court as the first woman to serve. And he sent. Um, a couple of people out to Arizona to check my record, because I'd held, held various public offices exactly. in Arizona. And there was plenty in old newspapers and stuff about me. So he had to, they had to check it all out. They couldn't sure Google okay. you at that time. No, no Google <laughs> at that time. So they spent time checking me out. And then um, I met with the people who were sent out to check on me. And then it wasn't too long after I was sitting in my chambers at the Court of Appeals in Arizona. And the phone rang, and it was the White House calling President Reagan. Sandra? Yes, Mr. President? I'd like to announce your nomination for the US Supreme Court. Is that all right with you? Well, gulp. I mean, I didn't know. Oh, what do you say to that? I don't know. I said, well, yes, Mr. President. And I had to go home that afternoon and then tell my husband, well, you won't believe the phone call I had today. Because <laughs> it certainly affected his life even more than mine. And so uh, that was how I got there. But I think what interested Ronald Reagan was my life as a cowgirl. He loved to ride horses. And he kept some horses all his life. Even in the White House, he kept a couple of horses, he and his wife down on uh, Rock Creek Park, yeah. at the place where the park rangers keep their horses. I even borrowed them a couple of times and went on a ride. But um, he loved ranch life. 
and loved horseback riding. And so I think that's what he liked about me. I don't know if it was my legal ability. Well, <laughs> I think as one looks at your record of public service in, in <laughs> San Mateo here in Arizona, yeah. there was a lot to uh, look at. It's so interesting now if we look at the bench and we see that three of the justices it's incredible. are women. I know. I go in the courtroom today and look up there and see three women, and it's just astounding to me because they're it took, what, 107 years or something to get one on there. So it was pretty amazing. Can you ever imagine that the court could be predominantly women? Of course I can. Good. OK. <laughs> this is one of our questions. <laughs> oh, dear. They like to work hard. They're used yeah. to it. Yeah. <laughs> Able to think more clearly sometimes. Yeah. Um, your quarter century uh, on the bench saw you as a proponent of clear thinking, civility, compromise when it was essential, and as David Gergen in a recent interview with you put it, the sensible center, how people yearn and lust for a sensible <laughs> center these days. Um, yours was often the determining vote in a five to four decision. And while I know and we need to share with our audience that you're not able to opine on any matters currently before the court, and many people also want to know if you'd like to predict the outcome of the presidential election, which occurred to me you no. may want to pass on. <laughs> <laughs> That's a short answer. No. OK. And certainly people are, I think, in many cases, quite familiar with your majority opinions. I'm wondering if you might comment on the importance of the dissent, and maybe to speak to one of your uh, dissenting opinions, which you authored in Kilo versus New London uh, in 2005. Well, on the Supreme Court, of course, every case the court accepts for decision by the court <coughs> that is orally argued at the court results in a written opinion, at, or several, at the end of the time. Uh, before the case, at the time the decision is released, you release the opinions that have been written about that case so that the public can see them. And in some of the cases, a fairly high percentage, the court is not unanimous. I guess in the last term, uh, something in the neighborhood of 30 percent had uh, separate opinions, dissenting opinions. So the court is not unanimous in, in a high percentage of cases. And when there are separate opinions, then you will have an opinion for the majority on a particular case. And you can have separate writing by other justices. There will be a dissenting opinion. And sometimes all of the justices on that side will join the dissent, although it could be you'll have a single dissent and then separate dissenting or separate opinions by the other justices. But the justices spend a great deal of time trying to think through their own thoughts and express them in writing. And not every justice writes in every case. If you can join a circulating uh, majority opinion, you don't have to say anything else. You can just join it or you can join a circulating dissenting opinion. But if you, for some reason, want to add something to the majority side and say something that hasn't been said in the majority, you can ask for the writer to include it. But if the writer does not, you may want to write separately and say what you want to say. And you can join a dissenting opinion, or you can write your own separate dissenting opinion, or a concurring opinion, whatever it is. You're permitted to write. And much of the time of the justices is spent in writing opinions. And the work of the court then is expressed in these written opinions. They're available on the web. You can get them yourselves. And it's very interesting to follow them if it's an issue you care about. It makes very good reading. So I hope all of you, at least on occasion, take advantage of your opportunity to look at and read the opinions in a given case that you have an interest in. 
it's, it's worth doing. I love some of the language in your um, dissent on Aquila on versus, Kilo. versus New London about nothing is to prevent the state from replacing any Motel 6 with a Ritz-Carlton and any home with a shopping mall or any farm with a factory. Yeah. Well, this was a case that involved uh, the regulation of um, what could be built on a certain piece of property, regulation by the city or the county. And um, there were some consequences in Kelo that were quite notable, and so a lot of writing in that case. Yeah, yeah. extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. People are curious as to what you consider the most difficult decision during your tenure on the court. Well, we had, remember Bush Gore? Does that ring a bell? <laughs> that was pretty hard. There were a lot of hard ones. And it's, it's just, it's, it's, there's some, I want to share all of these questions with you afterwards, but all I right. know that you can't comment on things before the court now. No, I don't do that. Yeah. So those of you who have asked specific questions in that regard, please know that I'll share your questions uh, with the justice afterwards so she'll know what has been um, on your mind. Um, you have a passion for civics education and um, you're very well informed about the paucity of information that especially many younger Americans, and I know that's why you were so eager to have young people with us today um, we know that in this last election, 51% of young people who were eligible to vote didn't vote. It's and pretty high. What well, was it for the adults? It's probably close to the same. Yeah. People, even though they're eligible and privileged to vote and maybe even registered to vote, often don't go to the polls and take advantage of it. We're going to see that again in a few days when people go to the polls, presumably, in a presidential election, and you will be shocked, I think, by how many people do not take advantage of that privilege and don't go. Somehow they persuade themselves that it doesn't matter, that their vote won't help decide anything, and they're not going to do it. That's a very sad thing. Now, we have some young people here yes. today, and probably among you are some young people perhaps even in high school, who are old enough to have registered to vote and will be entitled to vote in this presidential election. I'll bet there's some sitting here today. And who today, have that. here in California, mm -hmm. is your last day to register to vote. If so, if you haven't registered to vote and you can, go do it today. Don't miss that. That matters to all of us as citizens in this country. Perhaps Justice O'Connor, and I hope everyone will um, go to your website. It's www.icivics.org. Little I. Yeah, little, little I. Like Civics.org. You know, some like of the iPad, other equipment iPod, we use. iPod, all that stuff. Everything's I. <laughs> the, the little so I. Civics. But I, I think it would be very important, especially for the young people here, because so much of this is going to shape whether or not people are knowledgeable about our democratic institutions yeah. and how our democracy functions mm -hmm. or not is really going to uh, be very impressive in their lifetimes. And we have so many people listening to you on radio and who will be accessing this program on the internet. Would you speak to the goals that you hope might be accomplished by iCivics.org? I've been concerned for some time about how not enough people in our country are registering to vote when they can, and how not enough of those who are registered to vote do vote and make their voices known in our country. And it seemed to me that we were falling down on educating young people about how our government works and how every one of us is part of it. And the framers of our Constitution did a pretty darn good job when they wrote our Constitution and developed a system of government with three branches and uh, gave us our system that we use still to this day. And we owe them 
enormous thanks, but to make it work, each of us has to participate in our way. And it means when we're eligible to vote, we need to register to vote, and we need to cast that vote, and we need to care about what happens in our governmental entities, our city, our county, our state, and indeed our national government. That's how we participate, and it really does matter. So I hope that every young person here is planning on being a participating citizen the minute you're eligible. So if you're 18, you're there, and I hope you're going to be part of it from now on. You know, it's interesting, in one of, the, um, one of your recent interviews, you were mentioning something that I think a number of us just in our own workplaces come across, and it's people who are preparing themselves for citizenship tests, yes. who will say, will you ask me some questions? And then as the questions, as you're looking at the materials, mm -hmm. they're using for preparation, mm -hmm. so many people say, oh my goodness, I wouldn't be able to answer this. I have no idea. To become a citizen, you've come here, let's say, from Mexico or France or Italy or Nigeria or wherever, and you want to become a citizen, you have to take a citizenship exam. And it's hard. They ask terribly hard <laughs> questions. And I think if you hadn't studied up a lot, you couldn't pass that test. It's amazing how much you have to be able to answer to become a citizen. But if you just have gone to school here, you've been born here, you're already a citizen, you don't have to know much at all. It's just amazing. <laughs> it's quite a challenge to those who come from the outside and want to become citizens. It's hard. I think that um, once people go on your website, especially, well, I think anyone, but I think young people would be really attracted to it because so much of it involves gaming, which young people spend a lot of time with. Maybe you could comment yes. on that as a the vehicle. The website that I uh, have supported and gotten developed is one designed to, it's called iCivics.org, as I told you, and it's designed to teach young people how our government is organized, how it functions, and how to be part of it. And we teach with games that we've developed. And you play the games and learn all kinds of things. One of the recent games added was one on how we elect a president and how you're part of it. So you can go to that before, we, before it's too late and find out all about um, your role in electing a president. And I very much wanted to develop these games to show young people how your participation really matters and how you can and are part of what happens in this country. So do me a favor and look at iCivics and play some of those games and start teaching yourselves what your role is in this country and how to be part of it. You'll like it, it's fun. Yeah, I think once you get started, yes. you can't stop. You You'll just like have it. to keep going. Yeah. Let me just remind our audiences that you're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Today we're honored to be speaking with retired U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who is discussing her passion for civics education as well as her life and career. A number of questions come in from people in the audience who are in law school. Ah. Any little tips? Study hard. <laughs> Don't think it's just going to come. And you're not going to learn everything you need to know just by going to class, but you better go to class. You might miss something. But uh, do the reading that you're supposed to read and become a part of how our nation functions. I really thought law school was challenging, but it also opened my eyes. All of a sudden, I started learning why certain things are the way they are. It's because of legal decisions and legal um, action taken by our legislative branches that instruct us what we can and can't do. And it's just fascinating to go to law school and all of a sudden learn how we got where we are and why it's like it is. So that's a great privilege to go to law school. One person raises the question about do Supreme Court justices ever regret decisions they've made? And if so, what can they do about it? 
I suppose that it would be possible to, if you're, if you're a person who likes to look back and say, oh my God, did yeah. I do the right thing last weekend when I went out instead of stayed home and studied? Did I do the right thing? I mean, if you're that kind of person and you're on a court, an appellate court, maybe you're going to look back at opinions you wrote and ask yourself, oh, did I do the right thing? Was I right or was I wrong back then? I'm not that kind of a person. I put my effort in at the front end. If I have a decision to make, I find out everything I can, pro and con, make the decision and move on. And I don't go back later and say, oh my gosh, do you think I was right? I don't do that. But if you do, there isn't a lot you can do about it if you're on the Supreme Court. <laughs> the, decision, <laughs> the decision will have been made. Now maybe you could stay on the court long enough that some aspect of it would come up again sometime to the court and you could say, oh, we ought to take that and change that decision that was wrong. I, that could happen, but that wasn't the game I played. A couple of questions um, about the fact that being the first woman on the high court, did you encounter any awkwardness on the part of your colleagues? No. They, with only, now there are, there are nine members on the court. Congress can fix the number, they can change it. But for a very long time now, it's been nine. And um, so it's possible that the court can divide rather evenly among the nine. It can be five, four, or whatever it is. <laughs> and they were finding themselves at the time I was nominated they were finding that they were divided on a number of issues coming to the court, and the members were glad to get a ninth justice, male or female. They needed a ninth, so they were welcoming. It was good. We got along fine. I felt no resentment at all among any of my colleagues that I was there and I was a woman. They were, they were welcoming. Of course, we didn't have a woman's restroom back on the floor where the <laughs> justices work. That created a problem. <laughs> That's always a problem. Um, mm -hmm. So many times that was uh, encountered by, you know, the first woman on a mm -hmm. corporate yeah, board, I know and the first I know. woman here I and know. there. Um, you write too much. No, you're going to love all of these questions, but okay. everyone's just very keen on what's going to happen <laughs> in two weeks and what your comments <laughs> are on that. Now, um, what about, this is something that's already been determined, but a number of questions on your thoughts about um, the super PACs. What do you mean? The um, Citizens' Decision, Citizens United. But it may be something I'm that is sure still... I'm not sure the question is, but okay. you've got some more over there. We have left. tons of them. No, on your left, you've yes, got some Yes, I know. They, they keep coming in. Oh, this is fun. This is from one of the students up there in the balcony. You must have met several influential and important people. However, was there one non-political celebrity you have met that made your day? One non-political person that you've met where you said, wow, this is... Oh, I'm sure I've met lots. I mean, you, you meet such remarkable people for, when you're at a university because there are people in every field who are just brilliant in some field that you know nothing about. And it's such a privilege to meet someone who's the world's greatest expert in some aspect of life that uh, is not your field at all. For instance, someone uh, doing research in um, the manufacture and development of new drugs to treat certain diseases, and you learn a lot about that. Or some expert on, on plants and biology and talk to them about some of the things that I used to care about, getting better grass grown and how could you do that. I mean, there's just everything in the world being done 
um, in a university by experts in that field. And it's just fun to talk to somebody in any field of expertise. You're, you're bound to learn something if you open your mind and talk to somebody who knows more than you do in some other field. It's great. One of the students says that uh, the class is studying judicial activism and judicial restraint. And wondering what your opinion on this is, the notion of more activist, more restraint. Well, there's no general statement to make except this. It seems to me that at a Supreme Court level, whether it's a state Supreme Court or the US Supreme Court, the decision made by that court is going to be the governing principle going forward in that particular legal issue. And you want to be very careful about not reaching out too broadly. In my opinion, all these decisions should be written to solve the issue that's actually before the court and not try to write some sweeping principles of law that are going to decide all kinds of things in the future that aren't really before you at that time and that you don't have to decide. I think it's better for judges at the appellate level to write narrower opinions that deal with the specific issue in the case and not make broad rules that you don't know how they will affect us in the future. I think it's best to write narrowly. What about your views on elected versus the appointment Ooh. of judges? Many of our states elect their state judges rather than have them appointed. When the framers of our Constitution developed our system, as you know, all federal judges are nominated by the president and they have to be with the advice and consent of the Senate. The Senate has to approve that selection by the president. Now that's a good system for judges, in my opinion, and it has served our country well through the years. Many states don't follow that example and they have popular election of all their state judges. Now that means that candidates run, even for the state Supreme Courts in these states, and they need campaign contributions to pay for their ads and their signs and all that stuff. Well, who contributes money to them? It's the lawyers who are most likely to appear before them in court. Now, what kind of a system is that? You've got some attorney that you know full well is gonna be back before that judge representing different clients and he wants to be in the judge's good graces so he gives them a big campaign contribution. I think that is not the system we should have. California still elects some of its judges. Now you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you should change that. And, but a number of our states do it for their Supreme Court all the way down. It's really shocking to me that after all these years, we still have so many elected judges. That's not good. So I have spent some time in my retirement years uh, talking about this problem and writing a little bit about it and so on, because I feel strongly about it. I don't think that's a good system. Something we need to look into yes. further here, that's yes, for sure. Yes, we do. Now, <laughs> we want to know I'm speaking on behalf of several people. Would you support Election Day being claimed um, a national holiday? What? No. Why do you have to do that? <laughs> We've got lots of holidays already. No. People should be so eager to exercise their franchise that they shouldn't be given a, a holiday. I don't see to that do we it. need another one. God, I look around all the time, and there are holidays that I have forgotten we have, and it's just shocking. I don't know how employers are supposed to make a living these days, but anyway, <laughs> can't have a holiday all the time. <laughs> See, I think a lot of this comes from the lazy bee. It sure does. You, you we never had a holiday out there. <laughs> Those cows ate no matter what day it That's was. That's right, Even the on cows Christmas. needed to be milked. Even on Christmas. That's right. That's right. People want to know about um, whether or not the political leanings or the fact that 
people come have provenance through a particular political party. If Supreme Court justices, given their political or party leanings, influence the outcome of cases that come before the court? Well, I'm sure it does at some level. I mean, if you happen to be someone who um, believes strongly, for example, in, in state rights, and that more responsibility should be at the state level, and you have a decision to make that involves looking at some state law that at least the petitioning party before you in the court says is beyond the power of the state to enact, you might be more sympathetic to the defense in that. And that can happen. That's understandable. So there are some issues where you may have written in other decisions or in articles or something about your understanding of some particular provision, and then it comes up in a later case, probably you're going to look back at what you've already said before in some other context and be affected by it to some degree, I imagine so. Another question is, do you envision the United States moving to a true multi-party system? And how would that impact the Supreme Court? I don't Court? have any idea on that. I, I don't know. And whatever we do, it'll come up in some form or another to the US Supreme Court. You can be sure of that. We have a number of um, women in the audience, some of them in law school, some of them preparing themselves to run for political mm -hmm. office. Um, it's really remarkable, as you all know from um, mm -hmm. uh, Charlotte Schultz's introduction, that Justice O'Connor's been in all three branches of government, mm -hmm. even though only a third of Americans know what those three are. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and over half know who the judges are on American Idol. So we've really know, got to- I know, uh, They know American Idol judges, but Reestablish our Court. priorities. Yeah. But right. the question comes up, you had um, a, a long and wonderful marriage. How did your husband, who was trained as a lawyer as well, you went to law school together, how did he deal with your extraordinary prominence well, and success? He was just wonderful and... about it. He really was. I asked myself that question. How could he put up with all that he put up with? Because it was a lot for a man to have to reckon with for a wife to be in a position like mine. And he was just fantastic about it. He was totally supportive at every step of the process. He, I called him, of course, when President Reagan called me, and I said, John, you know, the president just called, and he wants to put me on the US Supreme Court. What do you think about that? What should I do? Well, you have to say yes. I mean, he was amazing. He was just amazing. And he, had, he was so outgoing and so open and so decent about accepting all these things that I did. I wish every woman who is getting married could marry someone as wonderful as I did with John O'Connor about letting her do what she wanted to do. He was great. This is wonderful. As someone who writes that um, our 10-year-old son loves iCivics.org. Ha, good. So it's just, <laughs> and describes it not as awesome, but as addictive. Yeah, But in is. a very it's nice fun. way. Now, you're not going to ask me about iCivics? I am. Or am I going to answer no, right now? Exactly. We're going to have you talk more okay. about it. I don't know if you all know what iCivics is, but I've been concerned for a long time about the fact that schools in our country, generally speaking, are not teaching young people much about how our government works. You know, we've had our students tested who are coming out of high school, I guess, against um, students from other countries, and we don't do very well in math and science. Did you know that? We rank down in the middle somewhere, not so hot. And so um, we have a lot of effort going on now to try to increase our capacity in, of our students, do a better job teaching them about math and science. 
But in the process, schools have sort of focused on things other than civics, which is teaching us how our governments work and how we're part of it and how we have three branches and how the whole thing operates. And I think it's terribly important that we continue to educate every generation of young people about how the government works at all levels and how we are part of it in making it work. This really matters. And so with the help of others, I started a website called iCivics.org. Now it's little i, like iPad, iPod, all that, iCivics.org. And we did it with games that the user plays. And they play the game and in the process, they learn how it works and, and what the principles are in that particular issue. And it is just terrific. The games are fun to play. It's designed primarily for middle school level, but it works all the way through high school. It even works for adults if you're a dum-dum, so <laughs> get on it. And it just, it is really a marvelous thing to have iCivics. It just couldn't be better. And if, if we can get, I've kept it free. It costs the schools nothing to use it. It's really something that young people learn a lot by playing the games and they enjoy it. So I want you as parents or grandparents to be sure that your grandchildren's or children's schools know about iCivics and get them to use it. It's just marvelous. And it's a boon for the teachers. Oh, it's wonderful. It's for the wonderful. school and free. And so whatever you do, go back today and get iCivics going in the school serving your part of the city or the state. Absolutely. That's not just a request and instruction. That's a, no, that's a court order, OK? <laughs> that's wonderful. Absolutely okay. wonderful. Um, the, the parents of the 10-year-old son who loves iCivics and says it's addictive mm -hmm. want to know, um, you've been so influential in your career, having such an impact on other people, opening up uh, tremendous mm -hmm. doors of opportunity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for women, for so many people. Who might you suggest have had the greatest influence on you? I don't know. I just respected so much my parents. They were fabulous. I really did. They were great. So I think that had to be it. And they were super. Yeah. And they were very excited. They attended your swearing in. Yes, they lived on this remote ranch. And who would ever have thought that they'd have a daughter who'd be the first woman member of the Supreme Court. So they came back and by that time my mother was suffering from a little Alzheimer's stuff going on and she didn't know who was who. And we got back there on the day of the swearing in and she met um, President Reagan and she said, now I think I've seen you someplace before. <laughs> so I said, oh that's right and tried to push her on. But uh, anyway. It was a great event for them because it meant that everyone they'd ever known their whole lives then wrote them a letter and said how interesting that their daughter had gone on the court. So they, it brought a lot of mail and um, contact to them and with the kind of isolated lives that they led, this was nice for them. Well, and, and one thing, you know, there's, there's so much that our society is dealing with, with people living longer and people yes. wanting to, as they say, age in place. And the, the glorious thing mm -hmm. was that both of your parents were able to live their lives. They did. They on did. The ranch. They did. And my father, who <clears throat> passed away at the ranch in his 80s, didn't spend one day in the hospital. And he had in his old typewriter at the ranch, a letter that he'd written part way the day before, and there it was, still in the letter the night he passed away. So he never stopped for a minute, I guess. It was amazing. Yeah, it's really, it's an extraordinary story. And then as you talk about the decision that you and your sister and brother, and I think another relative um, who were on the board of directors of the ranch had to make about how it was just not possible for you to continue 
with ranch because none of your children yeah, wanted. after my parents right. were deceased and my brother ran the ranch for quite a while and he reached the point where he thought he needed to let that go and do other things that he had to do. And so the ranch eventually was sold and it just broke my heart. I couldn't believe that we would be going forward without the ranch and the, uh, don't talk about that. I don't yeah. want to talk about it. No, and too and, sad. Yeah. And, um, too sad. I can't bring myself to go back. If you really love something and just treasure it in your mind, it makes it so hard to go back and see it. Even if it's well cared for, it, it's not the same. So I, I can't go back. And the way you end your, your book is really just on that, that you can't. No. Yeah, because people treat it differently from yeah, how you and your family right. dealt that's with right. it. But your brother, Alan, went on to uh, do, to really do some wonderful things in terms of land management. Oh, he and did, he did. He was a good manager. He handled things well. Yeah. Yeah. He and what good. about your sister, Anne? She has been a um, county supervisor and on the Planning and Zoning Commission in Tucson, Arizona. She has served uh, a long time, and she served in the Arizona legislature after I did. So she's been active as well. Must run in the family. I, I have a feeling. I have yeah. a feeling it does. She's been great. Yeah. You know, when people are appointed to positions for life, sometimes the question's raised, should positions be appointed for life, or should there be a limited term? Do you have thoughts on this regarding the high court? Well, the framers of the Constitution didn't set a term limit. It's worked out pretty well so far. And I thought it was time for me to step down, so I did. But I certainly wasn't required to do it. Right. right. Which was fine. And no regrets for stepping nope. down? Nope. No. I think there's so much to be said for growing up in a place like the Lazy Bee because it really gives you clarity of thought. <laughs> that's not always so observant in our, you know, bustling right. society right. today. Well, I just want to encourage this audience to uh, be sure that their children and grandchildren look at icivics.org on the website. <laughs> now, it is marvelous, and I want you all to make sure that the schools in your area start using it if they aren't already. And you'll see that it can make a difference in, in the knowledge that your community will have about how things work in government, whether it's state or local, and how they can be part of it, because it really works. So look it up. Your, your point is so well taken about the fact, and I think sometimes in our great country we become a little ex excessive if we see that something is not doing well, that we came in very low among the OECD mm -hmm. countries in terms of math and science. We did. That then we have to pull out the arts, we have to pull out geography, and we have to pull out civics yeah. in order to be able to concentrate yeah, on STEM. Yeah. Um, but this is really extraordinary what you've done, and I think as you said, it makes it so easy for teachers it because does. teachers are expected yeah. to do everything. I know, and this and plans sometimes some without applause. for them and it works well for them and it's fun for the students and they're going to learn a lot. Yeah. So it's good. And how fun doing it. Yeah. Do you hear about children younger than middle school? Yes. Going on to the oh, sure. website? Younger and older. Yeah. So it's both ends. It's a program for all seasons. Almost. The people that you sat with on the bench, um, do you stay in close touch I do. with many of uh, them? I keep an office at the Supreme Court to this day. <laughs> I agree to sit as a judge with a number of the federal courts of appeal we have 14 federal circuit courts of appeal in this country. And I voluntarily sit with many of them on occasion to decide here and decide cases in that circuit. Some of them need a little help, and so I will go and sit on some cases. I'm going in a week or 10 days back to New York City, where I'll be sitting with the Second Circuit on some cases there. That's my next 
assignment. So I've kept up with what the courts are doing and stay in it a little bit anyway. That's great. Yes. And what do you think um, increased media coverage um, of, of the court? And now with all of our social media If you mean outlet, by cameras in the courtroom, well, that we is could up start to with the that. justices. And so far, they have not wanted to put cameras in the Supreme Court courtroom. And that's their decision, and I'm not going to quarrel with it. They have to decide that. They're the ones subject to it. And if they're filmed all the time, then every place they go, they'll be recognized, recognized and yeah. approached. You know, the, the clarity of your thinking as well as your writing is something that has appealed to many people, and especially to many of the law students in our audience. A couple of people have asked if you might provide any tips for people wanting to improve the quality of their writing, oh, especially legal it writing. It just so happens that we have a brand new program on iCivics <laughs> to this develop writing, better writing. So if you have a youngster who'd like to know how to write more persuasively and better, we have a new program to do that, and I'm very excited about that. I think it's great. How many Learning how to be a, a, an effective, persuasive writer is hard. You have to work at it. So I'm thrilled that we've got this program on. And you have an advisory committee that you I work do. with on yes. iCivics. What yeah, kind yeah, of yeah. people? I mean, what sort of backgrounds? Oh, well, all kinds of people. Several of them are former law clerks of mine. I know they're smart because I hired them. <laughs> and I hired them because they were smart. <laughs> that is great. When justices retire, if they decide to retire rather than staying on for a life appointment, should they take into account uh, the timing of their retirement in terms of the political process? Or should it just Well, I be... guess that's up to the justice. There's no <laughs> rule. standard or rule determining uh, retirement. I think... Um, there are, you can't retire and be paid before a certain number of years on the bench, but then after that, uh, you can retire or not. It's up to you. And uh, I'm sure you can take into account whatever you want to take into, into account. Into account. Yeah. Like Justice Souter saying he wanted to return he to, wanted the, to, go back to the to peace and calm of New Hampshire. <laughs> he loved wonderful. his home state of New Hampshire and was so happy to get back there. Just like you to Arizona. Yes. Um, another thing from your wonderful, wonderful book, which I hope many of the young people will get, I'm sure you can go online and order it, um, is another quotation from Wallace Stegner about frontiers. And that frontiers, because many people think of you not only as a leader, but as a great pioneer, that frontiers free people from artificial restraints and throw them into contact with clean nature, contributing to a generosity, openness, independence, and courage unknown to the over-civilized. Uh -huh. The descriptors he listed, generosity, openness, independence, and courage, have all been applied to you as a public servant, as an associate justice of the Supreme Court, as a distinguished American, and as an educator. With our frontiers, the physical frontiers, rapidly disappearing, how can we provide opportunity for people to acquire these important virtues? Oh, well, whatever we do, we have frontiers. If you're fully employed and things that we all, with which we're all familiar in our society, you still have frontiers in the sense that uh, no particular profession has been so fully developed that there aren't still frontiers out there, uh, places you can go beyond what's been done so far. There are frontiers in every uh, walk of life, in every profession in business. So it's good to know what those frontiers are. And if you have the capacity to try to improve or enhance those frontiers in some way, do it, try it. And young people 
particularly need to look at that when they choose a line of work or what they want to do. I think it's fun to work in some area where there is still quite a bit of room for uh, going forward and making new discoveries and setting new boundaries. But that's true of most things, because we learn more, and then that opens still new avenues. Look at the medical field. Look at the scientific field. You discover one thing, and that leads to many more discoveries. So there's always room for going forward. Excellent. And we remind everyone that many answers to your questions can be found through the use of icivics.org. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. We thank yeah. our audience here on radio, television, and the internet. Justice O'Connor, we are in your thank debt. You. We thank, thank you. you so very much. It's been nice to visit. I'm Mary Bitterman, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place to be in the know, is adjourned.